Okay. All right, three, two, one, we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Be Kind, Be Happy. This is our second episode of our podcast series. What we're hoping is going to be a very, very long adventure. We're beginning today with the second episode. Today we have Lee with us, and he's going to be pondering me on this really good adventure that we're going to be having. Um, Lee, would you like to say something to the audience before we start? Hey guys, welcome to episode two. I'm really excited to, to get it going, so let's follow through, let's go. Okay, so I think um, we can begin the episode with addressing some of the questions that uh, were brought up in the first episode. So I think we can start actually with uh, the first one from a YouTube comment, which was from Nick Steele. And Nick was asking if we could uh, explain a bit about the monastic life. Um, I mentioned in the first episode that I was a monk for two years in Taiwan. And I think it's actually a very interesting experience. It completely changed my life, how I uh, perceive the world, how I perceive my own role in the universe and so it changed the way I, I behave changed the way I live my life and experience the world so I think it'd be actually quite interesting to begin this episode by addressing or explaining some aspects of the monastic life that I think would be maybe very interesting but also beneficial to other people um, okay so I can begin with uh, talking very briefly about the monastic life. It was very simple. Um, every day was the same. The idea was to maintain... Uh, the idea of the monastic life's lifestyle was to be as simple as possible so that the mind can remain concentrated and focused on what we were doing. So to cultivate mindfulness throughout the day or day. And so the things that we were doing was not really always going to be the focal point. The focal point was always how we do it and with what mindset we live. So a lot less influ a lot less emphasis on what we're doing, but more so how we're doing it. So something as simple as uh, sweeping the floor, which is what we did every day, was done with a lot of mindfulness, a lot of consciousness. So something as menial as sweeping the floor, we did with a lot of joy, with a lot of enthusiasm and with a lot of um, energy. And then we did a lot of, of course, meditation. I'd like to also first mention what type of monastery it was because different traditions of Buddhism would impact the beliefs and the ideas that went into the lifestyle. What I practiced was Mahayana, and it was um, humanistic Buddhism. So it wasn't one of it wasn't like a Zen Buddhist practice, or it wasn't like a practice that was based around meditation. It was more based around service and community, and uh, practicing Buddhism in the scope of the society and involving everyone with the monastery. And so from that perspective, the practice was very involved with the community. We spent a lot of time educating. We spent a lot of time uh, doing community services. So it wasn't, it was very fun in that sense that it wasn't like monotonous. It wasn't very uh, boring because we were always engaging with the uh, the public, the community. We would be doing like meal service, for example. Every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we would have meal time, like silent meals, where everyone uh, would sit together and eat in silence. And when you're not eating, you're serving and preparing or washing the dishes and stuff like that. And then in the spare time, we'd be having classes or... Uh, yeah, just engaging with the community, engaging with the community. Yes, Lee, did you want to say something? So, <clears throat> so you were there for two years, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how did your mindset change when you went there? Like when you went there, were you kind of like 
did you know much about Buddhism or were you just kind of like, Oh, I kind of want to do that. And then you, you went, you flew to Taiwan and, and did that. Or were you already living in Taiwan? Like how did, how did you get to a monastery? Like, you know what I mean? That's, that kind of interests me. Yeah, honestly, you know? great question. Um, it's actually quite interesting because my mother invited me to do a short term retreat. And most of the time it begins as a short term monastic retreat in which you have like a week or two week try or to say if you're interested in that in that lifestyle and then it's only after that where you can decide to do it long term but it also gives the monastery a chance to screen you to see if you're suitable for the monastery so it works both ways okay. and this was a special one because it was a 60 sorry a six month monastic retreat my mom suggested it and we did it together and even to this day my mother is still a buddhist nun and so oh wow okay yeah. i didn't know that yeah no it's very <laughs> interesting she's in uh, australia right now because the monastery has oh, really? many branches around the world and so she's in the the branch in australia um wow in terms of like what i was like how i got there and my my, my mindset before and after i had a lot of questions about life a lot of discontent a lot of like i guess existential questions like what are we doing here what's happening what how do i live a good life how do i be i guess ultimately how do i be happy how do i live a happy life that's free from anxiety and stress and suffering which was heavily on my mind and heavily um impacting my well-being so going into the temple I had so many questions about what is the right way to live what is the right way to think and the right way to perceive the world from a standpoint where we can abide in peace and happiness, which was foreign to me until I started practicing and studying Buddhist philosophy. Before that, I wasn't. So when did you? Sorry. Yeah. Go on. No, no, no. Uh, I guess what I was saying is before the, before I was a monk, I wasn't living with a lot of skill. I wasn't living with a lot of okay, peace yeah. of mind. A lot of joy a wisdom yeah i wasn't living with a lot of wisdom and it was only after i started practicing buddhism understanding the monastic lifestyle and the buddhist philosophy was when it changed my life i guess the two main things i would say changed my life the most regarding buddhist philosophy buddhist beliefs and values the first one is impermanence and understanding that nothing lasts forever, like literally nothing. Yeah, there is yeah. Not Important one phenomena that lasts forever, because I was always seeking the ultimate. I was always seeking the permanence in life, or the thing that I could ground my mind in. And so, seeking pleasures and happiness in, I was looking for what I could find happiness in that would be a reliable source of happiness forever, because like eating something that you enjoy once you stop eating it the joy goes away i was looking yes for a, exactly yeah i was looking for a state that's a good point i was looking for a state from an external source that could provide eternal happiness eternal satisfaction and i couldn't find anything buddhism was saying that it doesn't exist there is no state of mind or external source that can provide eternal joy and so that has the, to be internal. Yeah. Yeah. Internal sources. Yes. So that led me to looking inwards as opposed to outwards for satisfaction. And yeah. Then, so that's the first philosophy, which is the philosophy of impermanence. The second philosophy would be the philosophy of uh, cause and effect. And they are very related because everything arises from causality cause and effect which is why when the when the conditions change the effect changes as well and they go hand in hand understanding cause and effect and impermanence for example everything is conditioned by nature which makes it impermanent and so un by understanding cause and effect we can live skillfully in the world because we can contemplate what type of effect we want and then we can contemplate yeah. the causes and conditions that lead to that effect. So that really helped me understand or have a basis in which I can contemplate 
the entire life and phenomenal life by understanding what I want and then how I get it or what I don't want and what's been causing it in the first place. Everything that I think yeah. about revolves around causality, the law of cause and effect. And that really helped me structure my thinking and structure my thought process, which helped me understand and helped me tackle every question in life by understanding cause and effect. I like that. So, so you left the monastery how many years ago? It's been two years now, almost year and a half. Two years. So you think that? Do you think that you you left you left with a lot more answers than you went than you went there with, right? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, I left with a lot more direction, a lot more certainty, a lot more d- direction. direction. Yeah, yeah, and it I, like so over the last two years, have you felt the same growth trajectory? Or have you, have you noticed that you've kind of uh, stalled out at, at times or has it been like, kind of like one long, like one big long curve slowly growing? Um, like what, what would you, what would you say to that? Yeah. I think in terms of like, I think you, I would uh, relate it to like the economic cycle, like the cycle of the economy <laughs> up and down, but then yeah. the, the general trajectory is upwards. Yeah, peaks and valleys, but every peak is getting maybe a little bit higher. Uh, yeah. is, that, is that something you could say? I, I, yeah. I think to answer that question, there would be a lot of, like, what would be the indicators, right? Like, what would be an indicator for spiritual growth? For me, I, how I judge my spiritual progress is, um, am I becoming happier? Is my natural state becoming higher and higher in terms of, like, yeah. natural yeah. resting joyful state? The other one yeah. would be, am I learning to deal with my suffering better, like more, more skillfully, more wisely, so yeah, that when yeah. I experience negative states, I can change it around really quickly. And then the third one would be, how am I abiding in less suffering than before? And then I think the most important indicator is how much oneness and unity do I experience on a day-to-day basis? Do I feel an underlying sense of oneness with everything? And if I don't, and I feel very like just me, if I'm only focusing on myself, I know that I've got a long way to go. But if I can empathize, yeah. if I can feel myself in others, if I can feel that everything is relevant to me, then I think that's another indicator of spiritual progress. So I think that that kind of... Uh like that kind of touches on the point that I wanted to make about ego. Right. Like from what I get from that is basically like the less you identify with something, the, the better you, the better you seem to be doing, or that's even how you're judging your, 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 um, your happiness or your level of spirituality, you know, what you want to call it. So the more you've dissolved your ego or become aware of your ego, or your egoic mind, the further down the path you've gone. Is, is that kind of like, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think ultimately it's about attachment. Like, what am I attached to? Because a lot of it sources yes, from the ego. Yeah. So am I yeah. attaching to something that I can't let go? And usually that's, that's pointing to where I need to apply more attention to. So attachment, a lot of yeah. it is attachment yeah. to self, attachment to my desires, attachment to beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Well, that's where I think having an experience like uh, living on a monastery or, or even just an experience, like just um, maybe just being alone or traveling uh, alone or, or just putting yourself out of your comfort zone, seeing new things, you know, seeing uh, new people, how they're interacting uh, different cultures, stuff like that. It makes you kind of realize or, or maybe question your beliefs or at least uh, recognize like, oh, in, in Canada, we, we do this, you know. Um, maybe it's better here or, or, or it's just different, you know. And once you kind of um, add all those different, you know, levels into your, into your head, into your brain, you can like, it just adds to growth as long as you're being conscious of it, right? Because anyone can travel and like the the funny part is that I've noticed at least is you could pretty much go anywhere in the world and they still have your, your basic comforts, right? Like you can find 
a big club anywhere you go. So if you want to travel and just go to clubs and party, like you can do that. And that's great too, you know? Um, but, but, but you can, if you still have like an open, open heart, open mind, like you can really still, you know, get in touch with different cultures as you, as you go along the way. And the, the best way to do that I found is interacting with people and the best way to interact with people starts with being kind and being happy. Because if right. you just walk in there with a big ego, like I'm this big Canadian dude, uh, you know, like here in, um, Sri Lanka, for instance, like they might be like, Oh, who's this, who's this guy? Like, you know, but if you just are walking in there with a big smile on your face and, and your eyes are big, you're not, you're not walking in like this on purpose, but you, if you're genuinely uh, curious um, and kind, you, you won't, you won't believe, you know, like next thing you know, you'll be sitting down with like a bunch of people that you would have never thought you would um, interact with. And even if they don't speak much English, now they're attempting to, right? Like if you don't have their language, now they're attempting to. And, and it's really quite surprising how, how um, with enough time and patience and, and curiosity, you can, you can have a conversation with someone, even if they don't even really speak your language. Like just with, with hand signals, emotion, um, you know, like, y y you know what I'm saying, right? So it's, yeah. it's, um, and then you learn so much, like it's mind boggling. Or like what, one guy I really, really loved growing up watching and, 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 and learning from was Anthony Bardeen. And, and he always says the same thing, right? It's like one of his quotes, uh, paraphrasing it, you know, it's like, go out, see the world, go as far as you can go and eat, eat their food, <laughs> you know? Cause you'll learn a lot from, from trying their food. Like this is something they absolutely love. And, and like for me, an example I can think of just on the top of my head was like in Asia, they really love these fish flakes, man. And I'm a guy who has a lot of aquariums has, has had a lot of aquariums for his whole life. And I swear, like, like the fish flakes that these guys are putting on eggs, any meal of the day, they're putting fish flakes on there. It just reminds me of the fish food, <laughs> the fish, the flakes that I feed my fish or the little shrimpies that I feed my fish. And it, it's kind of like, whoa, you know, and, and it kind of, to me, it smells the same because it is in a way, right? That's fish meal. It's the same idea, right? Yeah. But I've tried it, you know, at least tried it. And I understand that if you were raised um, eating that food from, from an early age, boom, it has a unique flavor and you would learn to love that flavor, right? It's, that's all it is. You know, in Japan, we tried uh, different types of sushi and we had some uh, sea urchin eggs and the sea urchin eggs were very interesting. Um, me personally, it was like, I think it was like 20 or $30 per, uh, thing. So I just, I can't get over that, you know, like it just doesn't, to me, it's just not, not worth the, uh, the, the financial impact, but I ate it and I tried to feel what, what, what happens here, like how it melts in your mouth, what, what not. And I get it. Like, I totally get it. Um, not my favorite food, but it was interesting, you know, and, and they were really excited for, for us to try it. And, and, and I, I, I like, I appreciated the, the whole energy of that, of that moment. Right. So that's eating food in different cultures. One oh one. Nice. <laughs> um, nice. And I think so, like, yeah, no, nah, oh, go on. I just want to say something like, um, I think eating is actually very important because you connect with the people that you're eating with, right? Yes. And you're accepting yes. their culture, like food is very cultural. And so I think when you eat with someone, you share a meal with someone, especially in a foreign country, they immediately feel that sense of intimacy with you. They feel that closeness and connection. With yes. You. And just to touch yes. on what you said before in terms of being kind and being happy when you travel, I think it's because people sense the energy that you like your own, your energy. Right. So if you're kind Absolutely. and happy, like maybe you cannot speak the language, but people will feel the energy that you're vibrating, the kindness, the happiness, and it's, it's attractive and that transcends language. It's, um, Absolutely. It, it, it goes deep into your intentions, the type of person you are, and you can't really go wrong by being a kind, happy person, because the energy that you exuberate will be so, uh, so comforting to people, so attractive. And they just, you, you, they'll be drawn to you just because of the energy that you have. 
and if it becomes your character, yeah. it's effortless. It's effortless, eternal, unconditional, right? And then yeah. hopefully that people will respond in an unconditional way, right? Like, and, and, and again, like, um, you know, it's important to check your privilege as well. So for me as a white male uh, traveling in Asia, um, I, you know, I was, I was uh, you know, bl blessed in, in a lot of senses. Um, but, you know, people that a lot of people would tell me, you know, you're not like uh, the other, you know, whatever word they would use to describe me. And it, cause like, I, I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I was just interested, right? I wasn't like, you know, walking with the big chest in there, like, uh, you know, cause I saw so many foreigners, uh, especially in tourist areas. And that's kind of the problem, right? Cause the, the system is set up in such a way to cater to the, the tourist and, you you kind of get this elitist um, elitist um, attitude or ego, um, and and it's you know you know do what you want if, with your holiday, but like it, it's tough because then the people see that and they kind of uh, start stereotyping like all uh, tourists or foreigners come in. This is what they want. This is what they do, and it's not necessarily true. So it's important to dive down into the culture of where you're going if you really want to go there as otherwise if you would just want to go to a beach like lots of beaches you can go to and 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 that's fine too but but if we're on the path to happiness or the path to enlightenment um you know you have to it's important to see all the different cultures even within your own country um so i just wanted to touch on a different point though because we were talking about the monastery and, and and monkhood stuff like that yeah and you were talking about how um what were you talking about? How, how life's not eternal, right? Like life, uh, everything dies or everything has an end, you know, like there's no infinite, uh, you know, even though some of these jellyfish, <laughs> they've lived for a thousand years or something, but, but yeah, nothing's, nothing's infinite, right? Except for the universe maybe. Um, so I, I have a story about this, this monk that I interacted with when I was in Thailand, it was about two months into my trip. I was like a ball of energy, right? And it was the first time I was uh, to go outside of the country. So I was supposed to go to Laos for a visa run. And it was really like, oh, oh no, you know, because you hear all these horror stories leading up to it just from people you meet, other, other teachers or other uh, uh, travelers, you know. And they're like, yeah, man, like if they deny you out there, like, you know, you can't come back. And it's like, oh, all my stuff is, is in Thailand, in central Thailand. If I don't get back into the country, what am I going to do, you know? But so there's a lot of anxiety building up for maybe the first time since uh, since when I first arrived, because I kind of over the first two months, the anxiety went down. I became comfortable at my job. I had a, met a, a network of people. Um, I had, you know, daily activities that I did, stuff like that. But so now for the first time, boom, I'm leaving, you know, with maybe the idea in my head that I, I might not come back. Right. And so I was supposed to be just picked up by a van. Like it's hilarious. Uh, but anyways, that's supposed to be picked up by a van on the side of the highway at about eight, eight o'clock, right in the middle of central Thailand. And across the street was this big, huge wet market, the biggest wet market in, um, in central Thailand, in, in, in Karat, uh, which was the province I was living in. So I went there after work, five o'clock, whatever. It took, took about an hour on the bus to get there nervous you know heart pounding and uh but excited so i was like well i might as well spend some time at this wet market you know it's massive I've, I've gone by it on the bus before when i was going into the city so i just maybe spend an hour and a half just walking around the market i saw the craziest things you know i saw i saw like little uh sugar glider like little squirrels uh i saw an eagle I saw, you know, lots of turtles, you know, the, the typical dogs, cats, uh, tons of clothes, tons of art, tons of, um, you know, really interesting knickknacks, like all sorts of stuff, right? It, it seemed endless. Honestly, there was, there may be a thousand stalls or something, right? Wow. And they're little individual stalls. You walk in here and, you know, there's just a Thai guy and he's selling like, he has like eight dogs in a tiny little pen. You know, it's, you kind of feel bad for the dogs, but at the same time, like you just, just taking it all in, taking it all in. And then, I don't know, 7.30 rolled around, right? So I was like, oh, okay, well, I better get to the other side of the highway. 
and stand there because there's nothing there, just a little parking lot. It's not a bus station or anything. It's just a van that's supposed to be picking me up. And so I get there. Eight o'clock rolls around, nothing. All right. Nine o'clock rolls around, nothing. <laughs> okay. Ten o'clock. It's almost ten o'clock, and this monk comes. And that's where I was trying to get to in this story. This monk comes. And it's, it's almost, it's really interesting how it played out, or at least the way it's been encoded into my brain. It's almost like this monk just came out of the darkness of the, of the road, just came into my, into my eyesight while I'm just there at that point, what I would do when I was alone or nervous, I just film things around me. So I'm out there with my phone, just filming the stray dogs because they're starting to come out and get closer and closer to me. <laughs> and, and so the monk, the monk came up seemingly out of nowhere, out of thin air. And he starts talking to me and, uh, in, you know, in broken English, but this is what we were talking about, how you can still uh, find a way to communicate if you really want to. And I don't know if he saw me as a nervous, you know, kind of, or, or what's this dude doing at 10 o'clock on the side of the highway with his phone out like this and a big backpack on, you know, in, in a non-tourist area, right? Mind you, right? We're in the middle of uh, central Thailand. And, uh, and so we just keep talking and, and he just sits there with me. It was really interesting. I, I mean, he was really comforting, you know. Uh, and so it kind of stuck with me, right? But he, he said in broken, in broken English, we got this message. Or he got this message to me, right? And it was, less time every day. The breath is shorter every second. Time to create merit. And I feel like that might be exactly what you were kind of touching on. Like, everything dies, you know, everything ends. Literally every day you have, you won't get back. Like that's one less day you have in your life now. So if you, if you're just conscious of it, you know, you're not going to have full days, uh, every day, but you can try or make the, uh, the, the conscious effort too. So like, you know, knowing that every breath I take here is going to be one less breath or when I'm exercising one less breath, push up that hill, push up that mountain or, or have that conversation with someone that you've, you've been wanting to have, but you've just been putting it off because you're losing time in a lot of ways, right? At the very least, you, can, you recognize that, right? And, 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 and let it motivate you. Don't let it uh, uh, demotivate you, right? Like, like, it should be motivating because you're a beautiful human being and you're, you're blessed to be on this earth and you only get, you know, four quarters. So, so if you're in your first quarter, great, you know? If you're in your second quarter, that's great too. But now you're, you have a little bit less time. So how are you going to make your second or third or fourth quarter, uh, you know, your best quarter yet, maybe? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Just, just to touch on that, like just to build on that real quickly. Like, yeah, build on we, we, we can, like you're absolutely right in terms of like how limited our time on earth is. But we should also consider the fact that, in that within that 100 years, let's be generous and say 100 years, how much time do we sleep? How much time do we work? How much time do we have to eat and clean? Absolutely. So if we discount all the time that we, we, we don't have the flexibility to, to choose what we do, it leaves us with Absolutely. very little time that we can actually decide what I want to do. And yes, yes. Like a third of our time is sleeping. Even like a third is at work. So I think it's so important that we enjoy what we do instead of uh, live for the weekend, for example, or live for retirement, which is what some people do. Absolutely. It's so Absolutely. important to learn to love what you do as opposed to only doing what you love and seeking happiness in what you love doing. Yeah. It's more important to love what you are doing because you're always doing something. How can you change yeah. so that you can enjoy what you're doing? <laughs> Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it really comes down to your own attitude, right? Because you could be doing something um, that, that again, maybe it's been put on you that it's not re well, res your job's not well respected or, or you're, you're unhappy with your friends, your family, your people around you, but it's all your mindset. Sure. And, I'm, and, and that's the thing I'm telling you, I've, I've seen, I've driven, I've, I've driven out to the rice fields on, on a Sunday, which I would often do in my first town, and I'm out there in the mud on my little uh, scooter, right? Uh, a Honda 125. And I go out so far out there that you couldn't drive anymore. It's just pure mud and rice and streams. Get off the bike and just keep going. And it blows your mind because you see people out there. 
you're kind of like, wow, I didn't know there'd be other people out here. And they're, they're out there picking rice or, or, or tending to the, the field or, or whatnot. And I'm, I know they have a hard life and I know they, they work hard, you know, and they're baking in 40 degree weather, but they're, they're smiling, man. Like you wave at them and it's like, boom, this, their, their eyes light up. It's, it's pure, unconditional happiness. And, 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 nice. and if, if you can't, if you can't find that happiness there, well, you're not going to make it 40 years sure. uh, in the, in the field. You just won't. So, so there's a way to unlock happiness in anything you do. Um, and, and maybe that's passion, you know, maybe, or maybe it's kind of recognizing your ego and all the reactions that you have or attitudes that you have towards whatever you're doing. Um, for instance, like maybe you want to draw, right? Like I am terrible at drawing. I have this weird, uh, I have this weird thing where when I, I, I don't have skill with my hands in, in writing or drawing or anything. I visualize this beautiful dog I'm trying to draw, a really cute dog. I start going, I'm like, oh my, like that's not what I'm thinking, you know? <laughs> Some people have the gift to, to accurately draw and represent what they're visualizing. I don't have that gift. But my whole life, I've, I've kind of told myself, like, oh, you suck at drawing, you know? And so the second I start doing it, I had the intention to draw. I discourage myself. It's already there. So I start discouraging myself. Oh, this is ugly. This is horrible. But it's like, no, like the, I should just be drawing because I want to draw. It doesn't matter what the outcome is, right? It really doesn't matter what the outcome is. I'm not selling the painting. I'm not giving it to anyone. Maybe I am, but you know, it's not, it's not important. The act is the only thing that's important. And if I free myself, I probably would be able to be passionate about it and take the time to get better. Like that's the hilarious thing, you know? You tell yourself you're not good at something, so you discourage yourself rather than being letting yourself openly flow and be passionate about an activity. And maybe the passion only lasts for a month or a week or that single moment. But if you do it passionately, you're definitely going to do it better than, uh, than if you do it with uh, with the mindset like, oh, I suck at this. Like, how are you going to – you have to be so talented and have such a, uh, a poor attitude to draw something really well at the same time telling yourself you suck at drawing. You know what I mean? Does and that I make think, sense? Yeah, for sure. And I actually read somewhere yesterday that a person describing his success, he said that um, how he, like, uh, fulfillment for him changed when he was able to redefine what success meant to him. And for him, he yes. was focused more on uh, the journey, like, so the, the journey orientation yes. as opposed to result orientated. So focusing too much on the outcome was not beneficial to the man compared to mm. focusing more on the journey and the action, like what, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day yes. basis, practice what you're doing and putting more emphasis I, on that I than think, just the outcome, the result. Yeah. And I, sorry, but I think that that's something that we've been conditioned in our yeah. heads, been conditioned and all over the world. Like, I, you know, I, 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 we were in school, same thing, like teacher, teacher, uh, so bad. It's like, no, it's not, it's not bad. It's good. You know, in, in a lot of ways, this eight year old's drawing is better than my drawing. So it is really good, but, but it's a conditioned, um, it's a conditioned attitude or conditioned response, whether it's from watching TV, uh, movies, it, watching how people interact. And, and that's this ripple effect, right? Like if you have that one teacher who really, you, you value, man, like you really appreciate or you, you, you at least feel like they appreciate your work, your effort, your attitude, your energy. Uh, I've had probably two teachers my whole life that, um, that I felt valued all those things. Um, and they're in here, man. They're stuck in my brain. And I'm going to be a teacher and I hope to uh, replicate that and maybe take it a step further because I, I know that's the way to, to motivate and that's the way to um, kind of cultivate a, a child's passion. You know, don't tell them they're, they're bad. Like when you're eight years old, anything you do is going to be at an eight-year-old level. If, if something's not, that's great too. But you have so many years to, to practice and get better. It's you stop stop telling people that they're not good enough or, or stuff like that. Right. Like, cause you can always get better. There's people who, um, 
they're not athletic. They're, they're told they're not athletic their whole lives. And then they hit 30 years old or whatever, and they start running. And they find, wow, like I love running. They found this absolute passion. Now they're running marathons and stuff. If you told them at 12 years old when they didn't make the cross country team that when they're 30, they're going to be running marathons, they wouldn't believe you. They might not even understand. And, and so that's, it's, it's, it's like you have to, um, when you're young, you have to limit the amount of doors you close on, on, on young minds, you know, like let them follow their different passions. You, you know what I mean? Oh. And that applies. And that's, that's applies to what I said uh, last podcast where I said, if, if you're kind of in a rut or whatever, think about something you did, man, when you were young, when you're 15 or whatever, like, and maybe try it again, or at least think about it. Think about the energy you had when you were doing that. You know, when you didn't have all the other metaphorical cups stacked on your brain or on your back and, and was it just pure passion? Like, like for me, it was a lot of, uh, skateboarding, um, cycling, stuff like that. And so, so what am I doing? I'm going back and I'm cycling now and I'm just, it's, it's so sweet. Like nice. in the moment, I feel like I'm connected with all of, all of the, the Lees, all the years of Lees, everything all at the same time. And I'm just riding that bike, you know? And, and it's like, it's, it's not just a physical, uh, workout, which it is, but it's more than that now for me. It's, it's like a, it's like enlightenment while I'm riding the bike. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, I, I think... And that's passion. That's just passion, you know? Yeah. I think like how I relate to what you're saying is because I used to be an accountant and growing up like in a very competitive environment, um, I yeah. was, it was all like focused on results, focused on outcome. So it, it, like we weren't doing things because we enjoyed it. We were doing things because it had to be done to achieve something. And so we took the fun away yes. from life because we were just always focused yes. on what we get after we do it. So there was no enjoyment mm. in, do, in what we're doing because that wasn't the point. The point was to finish doing what you're doing to get to where you're trying to do, to get to what you're trying to get. And so this yes, goes against yes. what, we're, what we're talking now about focusing more on the journey, enjoying the, the process as opposed to being result orientated and just doing whatever you're doing focused on what you're getting afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Like when you're running a so bike, I just had a question. That I, yeah, go on. Yeah, exactly. But so I have a question about the accounting thing. Do you think if you were able to kind of apply that mindset, maybe you would be able to, to, um, do accounting. I don't know how to describe that. Well, um, and be happy. Do you think you would have, or do you think that you needed to have all these experiences? You, you, you think you would be able to do it now with, with more passion or at least with a more positive uh, mindset? Honestly, great, great question. And I think I would be able to have more positivity at uh, doing the accounting job. But at the end of the day, it's not my passion. It's not my interest as well. Okay. Yeah. I would do it and make the most out of it, but I would, yeah, not yeah. I would be thinking of doing something else that's more interesting to me. Okay. Well, that's, and that's what they say, right? Like find a job that doesn't feel like a job, right? So you, yeah. you went, you're a high functioning person. You were able to get your accounting degree at a nice school and go and work for a top company in the world and, and actually accumulate a lot of wealth from that. Well, not being passionate. Like some people can't do that. So that's a gift that you had. And it ultimately was part of your path that led you to then leave it all behind you, travel around Australia, go to a monastery, leave a monastery, come to, come to China and, and to Thailand and, and be who you are today. Right. So you're, you're a gifted person in that. It's, it's quite, it's quite interesting, yeah. dude. Thanks. It's really quite like, interesting. I, I think if I had stuck to being an accountant for the next 40 years, maybe I would look back and think, well, I've got a lot of accumulated stuff, but I don't think that's the life that I would have been happy with because it wasn't an enjoyable life. And that's actually the turning point in my life when I sat, when one day I was sitting on the computer like every other day, four years into accounting career. And then I thought I could do this for the rest of my life. It was okay. My job was easy. I was good at it. But <laughs> at the end of the 40 years, would I look back with, a lot of regret or a lot of satisfaction and for sure yes i would look back with regret and that was when i said okay then why am i doing it now i don't even enjoy it i'm not 
if I can do this forever, I get a lot of money from it, but it's, it, it's not good enough for me. I wasn't in it for the money. And I'm just so, thinking how many people are following a path that they don't enjoy just because of what they want to get, just because of like, like the result, the outcome of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. But then at the end of the day, you're spending Why? so much time doing things you don't enjoy. I think a lot of so, people well, that's that sort of life. Yeah, go on. Yeah, well, a lot of people are living that kind of life. And a lot of people a lot of people aren't, right, in different areas of the world. And that's why, I, you know, it, just to touch on your point, because I had this idea, right? And it's basically what you said was less time every day. The breath is shorter every second. Time to create merit. Definitely. Because you realize that you, every day was getting, sh was getting shorter. Your, 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 your life is... is um, you know, you're losing life in a lot of sense in a, in a weird way. I mean, in a positive way though. Um, and you just couldn't see yourself going down that road anymore. Some people don't recognize that until they're 40 years in and then they're kind of depressed and their health suffers and, and all these things. Um, you know, so that's kind of what you're trying to avoid in, in a lot of ways, but maybe that's your path, you know, and, and maybe there's other things that you'll find along that path that bring you happiness, you know, whether you have children or, or, or whatever. And, and I think it, you know, there's, we need accountants, you know, I'm not, yeah, that's, sure. that's something I wanted to touch on because we need accountants, but the more accountants that are, are passionate, uh, is probably better. Um, yeah. but, but you know, like it just wasn't your path, you know, even yeah. though you were high functioning and you could pull it off, uh, you know, ultimately you were always going to probably get to where you've, you've gotten now, you know, uh, yeah. you weren't able to accept, accept that, that position that you were in. Um, with that feeling inside. Um, so, uh, so I think the next thing is the ego that I wanted to touch on uh, before we finish today. So, um, the ego, like I want to define it, like together. Maybe we just something as simple as just defining it together, and we could even end the podcast there. But uh, so, sorry, my throat's a little bit uh, uh, sticky. I got a drink. <laughs> so from. For me, the definition that I, I'm going with is the ego is what you identify yourself with, right? Yeah. That's one, at least one aspect. The ego is so encompassing. It's unbelievable. And we've evolved. We've probably, that's what's led us to here is, is the ego um, through evolution from, from being hunter gatherers, uh, nomadic people to, to now you know, with our houses and our, and, and whatnot, right? Societal structure is really ego, but if so, so ego is what we identify with, right? So you either identify with material objects, right? Like you own a big truck, like I'm a truck guy. Uh, you know, you, you own a big house, like I'm a big house guy, <laughs> but you, you build this kind of idea of yourself in your head, right? But there's always going to be you in your head, who you really are and who you, who, what you really feel. And all those things. And if you let your ego get so big, it will, it will kind of suppress that, you know, but it will leach out in different ways via anxiety or it will leach out in, uh, you know, anger, frustration. Like you could have it all and you could be like a really short tempered, uh, guy, you know, like, I don't think that's good. You know, like you're not going to be kind and you're not going to really be unconditionally happy. Uh, right. Like there's no, to me, you can't be fully effortlessly happy if you've allowed your ego to get so big, right? Yeah. And I don't mean some people, the path to that is selling all their material objects. For me, that's just not going to happen. I'm not, I'm, I, or at least I haven't got there yet. I don't really want to do that, but I want to recognize it because as simple as recognizing the ego, yeah. I think is, is the first step, the, really the first step to, 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 going down the path of happiness, enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. So like, you know, I just bought a new laptop for school and again, super happy. Like I was buzzing, you know, totally buzzing. But it's funny because after I set it all up and stuff, it was really kind of the, the, the happiness was gone. And then I was thinking about the podcast and stuff and I've been buzzing for three weeks. So there's, there's other um, material objects will only give you happiness in the short term really in the short term. There's no way you can tell me that buying a laptop will, will be enough happiness or, you know, just the act of buying it and having it. There's, there's, it's what you do, you know, 
that, that gives you the happiness. Um, unless you have infinite money and you're going to buy an infinite number of laptops or cars, right? But like, at some point there has to be an end here. Like you can't just keep buying car after car after car or purse after purse or laptop after laptop. It's you're just looking for that dopamine hit dopamine hit where if you interact with people and you're full of love around you, um, that's the ultimate dopamine hit. You know, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the life uh, fulfillment hit, you know, and the life fulfillment hit is going to make you eternally happy. And eternally grateful, you know, whether it's through kids, family, friends, uh, whatever. So, uh, what what are your what's your thoughts on ego? Um, how do you define it? And yeah, go on. Dude, honestly, like this is such an important question because in Buddhism, in as a monastic, you want to be liberated, right? You want to attain awakening, enlightenment, and in many many ways, I say all you have to do is to detach from the ego because the ego yeah. is the source of all suffering. The ego is the source of all delusion. And if you can sort of transcend the ego, then that's the ultimate peace, the ultimate state of the ultimate state of liberation. So ego yeah. is what I've been contemplating for the past five years now, even before my time as a monk. Yes. And I think it's so tricky because First of all, I, I completely agree with you. To define ego is the sense of self. Having a sense of self that you identify with. And so initially for a few years, I was trying to get down the path of not having an ego. But then I started to realize that everything that I was doing to detach from the ego only created a different ego. The ego of having yes, no ego, yes. the ego of a, of a monk, yes. the ego of saying, I don't attach to anything. The ego of saying, I yes, don't desire yes. anything. And so it's like, I just went back the other way. Uh, and I, it, it I love came that. to a cross point where I was like, then what do I do? If I'm, if I have a, a big ego, then I go down the other way. I've got a small ego. It's still an ego. Cause then it, I, I was proud that I was, a very disciplined person. I was proud to be a man that wasn't, yes. you know, just pride. And that was also an ego in having no ego, but that's a massive ego was in itself. Yeah. But I don't, so I don't think that's necessarily wrong. It's just as it happens. So my, my idea is just to recognize the ego. Yeah. And for me, once I stopped putting uh, similar to you, similar to you, I go down these kicks where I'm like on like a life, a life journey kick and uh, I spent some time in the isolation, sensory deprivation tank, stuff like that. I really would feel like I'm enlightened. And then I'd hit this point where I'm like, Oh yeah, man, like I'm enlightened. now. I'm one of those enlightened people. And it doesn't, it, that was immediate. That was like a critical point where the work kind of was like, Oh, we're doing so good. Now we're going back down to another Valley, you know? And, and so what I've come to now is just recognize it. And then once you recognize it, you don't have the same reactions. Or even if you have a reaction, just recognize it. The other reaction, the next reaction might be a little bit less. Stuff like that. And for me, that's helped me with meditation. Because before I would go into meditation, like, oh, I have to still my mind. Like, you know, I'm going to be a med I'm going to be meditating. Uh, I'm going to be doing a meditation, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and now I'm just going into a meditation like, oh, let's see what happens. And, and just breathing. And and it's really working like, Oh my God, in the last month, I've really gone, had, had really critical stillness, love, gratefulness, feelings through meditation. And, and it's, it's like, maybe I hadn't been meditating properly, my, you know, ever before, but you know, maybe this is common sense, but for me, it was as simple as recognizing the ego and, 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 and it's like, that's mindfulness in a way, isn't it? So it's, it's unlocked a lot of different things for me. Right. And like, just like today, like, I think I'm a lot less nervous, stuff like that, because a lot of that building up to the first podcast was, um, you know, was, Oh, what are people going to think of me? Oh, we have to record this. Then we have to edit it. Then we have to post it. You know, then I have to see if people watch it and it's like putting yourself out there in this vulnerable state. But I think it was a lot of ego too. Like what if people aren't going to like what I say and that, then that nerve builds. Whereas now it's just kind of free flowing, which is how I normally act anyways. 
So, so it's, 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 you know, maybe you have to put yourself through that state first in order and then just recognize it, you know, it be introspective thought, you know, um, don't hide from yourself, you know, sleep, sleep peacefully. Um, the great Byron said to me once, how you, this might sound pretty wild to people, but how you sleep, how you go to sleep is how you will die. So if you go to sleep grateful and at peace, uh, you, you, hopefully you will die grateful and you will die at peace because ultimately in sleep and uh, in death, there is no time, you know, there's no perception of time. You know, you have no concept of eight hours on con like, you know, maybe you dream when you wake up, Oh, I had like a five minute dream, but you were unconscious for eight hours. There is no time. So go to sleep peacefully um, and happy, like with a smile on your face because the struggles of your day are over and yeah. think about ways that you can improve your, your next day. Cause again, uh, less time every day. The breath is shorter every second. It's time to create merit. And for me, creating merit is being kind and being happy. It really is. Nice, nice, nice. Like, um, <laughs> What do you think of that, Byron? Dude, I, it's, it's awesome, man. Like, because right now it seems like today's podcast is themed around like a monk, right? Like the monastic life. And yes. what, before I became a monk, I was fascinated by meditation because I thought that meditation was about cultivating everything from the inside so that you can feel mm. whatever you want. Like you can navigate through your emotions and feelings how you want to do it. You can create whatever, you know, like it's about mastering the mind. And so going into the monastery, I had so many questions about meditation. How do you meditate? What is it? And what does it lead to? Because I thought that meditation led to enlightenment. And there's like different yeah. stages of meditation. And so I meditate every day. And I wanted to ask you about what your thoughts on meditation is. Because there are so many viewers or people that are interested in meditation that are thinking, why should I meditate? And how do I meditate? What is it? Where are its benefits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's just quickly so, touch on this topic. Just very, like we can maybe expand on it another time. But in, uh, just to start us off, Lee, what are your thoughts on meditation? What is it? And why is it important? Okay, so Go on. I think uh, the, the best thing I can do is talk about why it's important to me and what it is to me. I might not, I might not um, describe, because like, I find you're more of an expert in this field, right? Like <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the novice, like I'm the guy who has uh, tried to meditate over lots of different periods of his life and had some success and it was usually blind success when it happened and then always tried to recreate that moment. And I think once you start trying to recreate the moment, that's when you fall into a trap that you'll never, you'll never still your mind, you know? Like I've, I've laid there before and I've been like, oh man, I remember that one time, like I had my eyes closed and I was just at peace. And then I started thinking about that. And then I started thinking about like high school. And then I started thinking about like what I ate for dinner and it's just horrible. But once again, once I, for me, um, sorry, what was your question? What is meditation to you? And, uh, and why should we meditate? <laughs> Well, okay, we so meditate? why should we meditate? <laughs> we should meditate. I, I think it's amazing. Stilling the mind in, in, a, in almost like a sleep-like trance, but not being asleep, is you're letting, you're letting everything flow, everything flow. And I find that when I, when, I, um, when, I, when I do reach that still state, which is not every time, uh, I come back with a smile on my face. I open my eyes. And I have energy. It's not like when I went to sleep and I wake up all groggy and stuff. I wake up with energy, typically with some new ideas in my head, with uh, a sense of purpose, uh, and really just this gratefulness. This, that's the best word I can describe is a feeling of gratefulness. Because I, I really am grateful to be here. And, and I'm, I, you know, I'm lucky, you know, like I have a lot of uh, things in my life that I'm really, really grateful for. And you kind of forget it. You kind of forget, even I forget, um, you know, amongst all the metaphorical cups being stacked as the day goes on, you know, like I could be having a really good time. 
I, I've always been kind of someone who reacts uh, a lot. So if I'm smiling at someone, someone gives me like a dirty look, it hits me. Like, it's like someone just shot me to the pellet gun. Like, oh, that's not good. Why, well, how, why? Hey, Lee, like, Lee, how does, how does meditation lead to gratitude for you? Um, I don't, so that's the thing. I don't really, I don't really know. It, it's more just going, coming to uh, being at peace. Hmm. And through peace, there's gratitude. Well, how, how uh, does it lead to peace? How does it lead to peace? <laughs> It's hard for me to explain to you. Uh, it, it's, it's okay. So a lot of the meditations that I do are guided meditations. I find that that really helps me with my, with, with slowing down my brain and I'll usually let the guided meditation end and, and then I'll be in that trance. And then whenever I open my eyes, I open my eyes. Sometimes it's 30 minutes. Sometimes it's 40 minutes. Sometimes it's two minutes. Right. Uh, so the guided meditations that I do are typically about peace, love, uh, nice. mindfulness, you know, and so, you know, whether it's hearing these words, you know, like with, um, uh, increase your heart's vocabulary, uh, you know, listen to your, your heart and feel your heart beating stuff like that. It, it for whatever reason, it cultivates a sense of peace and love in my life. Nice. <laughs> so you might be better at describing this, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. so what for you, we'll, we'll touch on your, on your question before we wrap it up. Okay. Okay. I think this would be a good place to wrap it up. But, um, so for me, I, th I think about this every day. Think, think about how to meditate because in, I think meditation ultimately should be beyond just sitting in meditation. Cause if you're, if you can only do meditation when you're sitting, then it's very limited and it's very inconvenient. Yeah, yeah. So I guess how mm. can we bring the meditation to everyday life so that you can meditate 24 seven. So first of all, what is okay, meditation? Yes. To me, meditation is like mindfulness, how to maintain mindful throughout a period of time, mindful of what mindful of whatever you want your object of concentration to be. So you can be mindful of your breath uh, in breathing meditation, mindful of your bodily sensations. This is the Vipassana. Uh, meditation on sensations, meditation on your thoughts, meditation on your feelings, meditation on whatever, whatever you want your object of concentration to be, that is where you place your attention. And when your mind jumps to random stuff, you just gently bring it back to your object of concentration. So where, whatever your object is, it doesn't matter. The point is to keep it there. And so in everyday life, how can we apply this is by choosing where you want to place, <laughs> choosing where you want to place your uh, attention, your awareness, and then just keeping yes. it there until you want to move it. That's how we can gain mastery of the mind as opposed to being a slave to it. Because a lot of the time, yes. our, our experience of life is determined by the state of mind as opposed to using the mind as a tool, we are a slave to it. And that's when the life experience is so negative. It's so, it's like compulsive because we have, we no yeah. longer have control of the mind as opposed to instead we are being controlled by it. So back to the question of what mind, uh, what meditation does for me, it's about getting clarity of everything. Yes. Having clarity. So, yes. A good meditation session for me would be being able to maintain clarity the entire time and then finishing the meditation yes. with greater clarity. Clarity of what? Clarity of your sensations, your thoughts, your breath, your sounds, Cla having everything more clear. And that helps with everything in life. It helps with your problem solving. It helps with yes uh decision making it helps with your goals it helps with understanding yourself and so i think meditation leads to clarity uh i try to keep, absolutely yeah like i try to keep things simple because if i can't simplify it in my mind i don't think i understand it very clearly enough and so if i want to keep this short and simple what does meditation do it leads to clarity and so whatever you are thinking, it's very clear. Whatever you are doing is very clear. How you feel is very clear. Yes. 
And so when we meditate, do we, do we finish the meditation? Does the meditation lead to us having more clarity? And if not, then maybe we yeah. can require some tweaking. But if we can finish the meditation with a heightened sense of clarity, then, that's, then we're doing it properly. And it took me a long time <laughs> to start realizing that I should be meditating yeah. for clarity. Before I was meditating for pleasant sensations. And so when I was having a negative <laughs> experience for meditation, I thought I wasn't doing it right. I thought I was disappointed yes. in myself. But then I realized, okay, at least I'm aware that my meditation was full of negative sensations or negative feelings. There's something going on inside. Yeah. So just being... It's bringing awareness to that, right? Exactly. And that, yeah. if you can do that, then you're doing it right. Okay. That's, that's, that was a really good point. I, I, well, I figured you would articulate it better than me. Um, you're definitely more experienced and you've, and you've read more on meditation. I told you I'm the novice guy, but I'm having a lot of like great success from it. And so I've, I've been kind of trying to put aside anywhere from uh, 30 minutes to an hour uh, to meditate. And I, I've, I've taken the pressure off though. Right. So like if I, if I can only get 20 minutes in, or if it never really, I never get the stillness, I can still give it a fair share of time to attempt it. But if it never happens for me, then, then that's fine too. I just go on to the next thing. Cause I have lots of things to do in the day. Um, you know, and by taking that pressure off, uh, it's really helped. So, so if anyone's trying to meditate, wants to meditate, just kind of have the feeling of excitement for it, yeah. but don't, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself. So, you know, there's no so, reason so, to put pressure so Lee, on yourself. What type of advice would you give someone who wants to learn how to meditate? Or like wants um, to try to again, or just, just less, less pressure on yourself. Um, you know, you're not going to be a guru if you meditate one time and you're not going to be a guru if you meditate a thousand times. It's, you know, maybe you will, but, um, yeah, just no pressure. Use it as like a relax, man. Like it's almost like a nap. You could, you could take it as like a nap. Like you, you're just taking 15, 30 or an hour of your day, um, to just focus on you or, or focus on nothing, you know? just for clarity and it's it's going to help you it's like the macro level of this is so is there's such a good pay yeah. you know like whether you're stressed out from work or relationship whatever you take the time to do this and hopefully you, eventually you get better at it and it's going to pay off you're going to be better at work you're going to be better in your relationships you're going to be um better in your in your fitness you're going to everything pays off your energy level is probably going to increase so there's there's so much to be gained from from meditation it's something that we're going to have to cover more extensively especially as i keep attempting to do it because again i'm very much uh, a beginner in this in this because as i said earlier in the podcast i would find myself getting to these points where i was like oh yeah i think i kind of got life figured out and then boom down so what was i missing i think i was missing a nice healthy structured uh, no pressure meditation routine. That was one of the things I was missing in that path that I'm implementing now on this journey. Nice. <laughs> All right, look, just before, uh, yeah, yeah, just before we finish I, off, well, because we're doing these every week, I think we can maybe introduce like what is a lesson you learned this week that you want to share with others or share with, you know, like just to say like, what, what did you learn this week? Like what breakthroughs did you have? Or like, what changes did you experience that you think is worth sharing? Well, let's start with you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Dude, I, <laughs> I do this like every single day. I'm always, and I, I'm so grateful Lee, that now I have someone like yourself that I can message and like bounce ideas off. Um, one thing Same. that, yeah. One thing that really uh, changed everything for me this week, I guess it, we, we talk about duality and then non-duality. And so we learned that ev everything is dualistic because everything has a polar opposite. Nothing abides on its own because it's impossible. And this is also the idea of connect, uh, conditioned reality. For, so for example, happiness only exists because there is sadness as its polar opposite. And so it's i'm starting to realize that it's impossible to accept a state to achieve a state without accepting its polar opposite 
and this took me years yeah. to come up to to come to terms with because i thought that if we want to be i i wanted to be happy forever and then how is that possible like what type of goal am i establishing for myself and i wanted yeah. to be happy forever but now i'm starting to realize this week i'm starting to realize that nothing exists without its polar opposite and so yeah. when you when i observe something i have to i have to observe it with both sides of it so how how i apply that is what problems do i have that i cannot reconcile with is because i attach to one side but not but i'm trying to escape the other side and that's impossible because wanting one thing creates the polar opposite just by this being in existence so you can't have happiness yeah, without sadness because sadness is what creates that makes is what makes happiness possible in the first place so yeah so you sorry so it's yeah it's 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 one of those things like if you just give someone the end result without the struggle and all the the path um along the way you you you're right it's it's exactly right and that's why you need your baseline to be happiness which it might already be or your baseline to be love so that you you feel sad cuz part of feeling love is to feel sad you know is to feel yeah. vulnerable that's being open and part of being happy again as you said is to be sad at times cuz if you if you're never sad then you're never going to really even appreciate how happy you are when you are happy so you need both you know like you you absolutely need both but don't dwell in the sadness or don't don't embrace the sadness in such a way that um like the quote misery loves company don't 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 let that become your unconscious uh you're always sad because that's it's it's just going to lead you to this stillness that uh, and and not flowing not on a journey not on a on a life trajectory you're just kind of stuck and until you get out of that sadness um you you won't you will never appreciate how amazing life can be or 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 whatever you know like you have to recognize it and it's hard sometimes when there's real uh when you're in a really tough situation it's definitely hard i've been there but it will flow away so just be conscious recognize that you will flow out of the sadness back into happiness and once you recognize it it's all little recognitions once you recognize that maybe that's the the start that's that's absolutely the the start first thing you could do is recognize that this will not be forever and you know and then and then keep going hashtag yeah. keep going nice <laughs> nice you know yeah thanks but, for that um yeah yeah so um yeah thanks for I, I don't know like, what i was trying to say because you're absolutely right like yeah. i think uh reconciling or accepting our our shortcomings our weaknesses the things in life that we that create us pain and suffering only when we can accept those and only when we can reconcile with those can we have the other side because i i i i'm starting to think that it's impossible to absolutely only want one thing without and then rejecting the other thing yeah yeah what well, and impossible what well, what about light without oh, dark yeah. you know yeah <laughs> it's it's just it's life and and as we said as we said uh, last week which is very funny was when you said uh uh when we were talking about cheesy lines right and that's how we're going to end this one embrace the grind right yes right. Embr- and i said embrace life and all of its struggles because yeah. you have to and once you appreciate all of the struggles all of the lessons once you embrace that and appreciate it you'll feel grateful for all of them I'm grateful for everything that's happened in my life because it's led me to this moment and this moment is great. <laughs> in this moment I have a smile on my face, you know. In this moment I'm going to go eat lunch. <laughs> you know, like all these little things. So it's 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 important to get to that level and part of getting that to level is listening to conversations because maybe you haven't been having these conversations with people but you've been having the thoughts or maybe you never had the thought but now you do and now you want to have so go out there and and be um a loving kind happy human being and that's 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 the only goal for this podcast really isn't it yeah yeah 
That's it. So I'd like to wrap it up though. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, uh, if you guys um, want to follow us on social media, uh, Instagram, I'm at, at Lee Rath, L-E-I-G-H-R-A-T-H. And your Instagram? Mine is Byron underscore be kind, be happy. I'm actually going to add these labels uh, with our Absolutely. name. Absolutely. I'll add it. Absolutely. Well, edited version. And there's a, there's a blog website where Byron spent the last couple of years writing extensive articles. He also has videos on meditation and yoga. It's pretty wild. Um, it's called be kind, be That's right. And there's a shop there where you want to buy t-shirts and stuff like, but uh, oh, cool. I think that's further down the road. This, they're beautiful t-shirts though. It's, <laughs> it is true. Um, uh, what else? And we've also uh, got the oh, podcast so the, as well. Yeah, go on. Yes. So yeah, just the podcast is, um, is available now on Apple uh, podcast app, Spotify, Google podcasts, Castbox, and pretty much every third party podcast provider because nice. they, um, they, they, they all piggyback off of Apple and Spotify's podcast network. So, so you'll be able to find this podcast. I hope you do. And I hope you made it to the end. So have yeah, a good day, bro, everyone. And use this energy for friends, good. Share with your friends. I guess uh, just to build on what Lee was saying, like we, the purpose, the goal of our podcast is, is to bring some awareness and some consciousness into our life journeys so that we can live with more mindfulness, more joy, happiness, because ultimately everyone wants to be happy and free from suffering. And this is exactly what we want to explore. Absolutely. This is what we want to explore with our podcast, finding every single way possible to live the best, happiest life while reconciling and managing all our pain, suffering and, and anxiety that is also part and parcel in everyone's life. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone. See you next time.